Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the ACRM Stroke ISIG virtual happy hour. We're so happy uh, to have you here today. We have um, a really good topic for discussion today. This webinar is uh, being brought to you by the Movement Intervention Task Force of the Stroke ISIG. And if you're interested in joining um, our, our stroke special interest group, um, Veronica Rowe, who is chair of our group, is um, online and we have her email somewhere in the slide. So um, Veronica, did you wanna invite folks to join us? Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us at our virtual happy hour. Thank you to Cecil Alpasan for her awesome organization of it and the movement task force led by Sue Fazzoli and Elena Denoso brown uh, for kind of sponsoring and putting this together and most of all to Candace Osborne for doing it. So uh, thank you very much. Please uh, feel free to join us anytime you'd like for uh, any of the Stroke ICID meetings um, during conference and any of the task forces. I also wanted to give a shout out and a congratulation to Candace, who has been awarded this year's ACRM Young Investigator in post-stroke, uh, post-acute stroke rehabilitation. And we look forward to seeing her and hearing her presentation at conference this year. So thanks again for everyone. Thanks, Veronica. And I just want to remind everyone to please, uh, use the chat box for questions and we can help monitor um, um, the questions and have the discussions for uh, the end of the hour. Uh, I would like to introduce um, Susan Fasoli now who will be uh, introducing our speaker. Great, thank you Cecil. Um, and Candace, thank you so much for being here and I, I welcome you all to this virtual happy hour. Um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Osborne. She actually trained and worked as an active duty U.S. Army OT um, in multiple rehabilitation settings, managing complex polytrauma cases in both inpatient and outpatient places. Uh, she currently specializes in neurological rehabilitation, working predominantly with patients recovering from stroke and traumatic brain injury and their family members. Her research and clinical expertise are in the areas of functional outcomes, self-management training, caregiver training, and community integration. She was also trained in the International Classification of Functioning, or ICF, um, and the ICF Outcome Measure Evaluation Technique at the World Health Organization's ICF Research Branch Headquarters in Switzerland. She earned her PhD in rehabilitation science and a master's of public health from the University of Texas Medical Branch or UTMB in 2015. She earned her master's degree in occupational therapy from Texas Women's University in 2007. She's an assistant professor in the department of PM&R at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And we are happy Candace to have you here with us today. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay. Do I have control of these now? I believe so. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to talk about an area of research that we've focused on in our department for a few years now. And it's sort of morphed and evolved over time, but I'll talk some about the basic concepts and also about a pilot study that I just recently com uh, completed that was funded by the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. So today I'm gonna to talk about addressing the needs of individuals with stroke during the transition from hospital to home through problem solving training. And we've been implementing implementing problem solving training early among both patients and caregivers and studying the outcomes over the last few years. So by early, I mean during acute care or the inpatient rehab stay. And our overarching question has been, if we can implement a self-management program based on problem solving, can we teach patients and caregivers the skills to solve their own problems early on and thus ease that transition from hospital to home and increase independence and self-efficacy long-term? So I'll get more into the weeds on that in just a minute. All right, these are my objectives. I'll touch briefly on the current needs of and the supports for patients with stroke and some of the limitations of these supports. And then I'll explain problem solving training, how it works and why we're implementing it. And finally, I'll describe some of the research we uh, plan to do in the future. 
So an estimated 7 million people currently live with post-stroke disability with a projected increase of 4 million by 2030. And approximately 70% of 1 million people who experience stroke annually in the US are discharged home. And this transition to community is associated with a myriad of emotional, social, and health-related challenges that are intensified by the abrupt lifestyle changes and new roles and responsibilities for both the stroke survivor and the caregiver. So regardless of injury, severity, or age, individuals with stroke report diminished quality of life, decreased ability to perform ADLs, diminished participation in social roles and routines, and also feel ill-equipped to manage the transition uh, challenges, and that's specifically from hospital to community after stroke. So for many, these items coupled with limited access to rehab opportunity and community resource, this, it results in a high readmission rate after stroke. So we know that when patients are transitioning from hospital to home, that information or education alone does not adequately prepare stroke, to, stroke survivors or their caregivers for the obstacles that they may face in those first few weeks or months um, after returning home. And those obstacles can really run the gamut from transferring in and out of the shower to reintegrating into the community or changes in their roles and routines, psychosocial issues, so on and so forth. Patients and families who participate in problem-solving strategy training prior to discharge feel better prepared and have significantly higher self-efficacy during transition than those who do not learn problem-solving skills. And current guidelines state that patients with stroke should be actively involved in goal setting early after stroke and patients report that collaborative goal setting increases feelings of empowerment, ownership of treatment, focus and the confidence to better manage their daily lives. And we also know that the majority of patients are able to participate in collaborative goal setting, even on the acute uh, care stroke unit. However, collaborative goal setting occurs infrequently in our current health system. So it really is a critical need to provide evidence-based self-management training early to stroke survivors. So they have the problem-solving skills required to overcome the barriers and problems that arise during that transition back to the community. Okay, so I'm gonna explain problem-solving theory or problem-solving training in general. So PST is a self-management technique in which the individuals learn a simple and systematic method for evaluating problems. They generate, generate and select solutions. They develop specific goals and action plans, and then they evaluate and revise those plans as needed. So an individual learns to set achievable goals under the coaching of a therapist, and they use this simple mnemonic that you can see here in the slide, A, B, C, D, E, F, to walk through those steps of active problem solving. So what's especially powerful about the approach is that it doesn't matter what the problem is that the person wants to address. It's not problem specific. It's more of a metacognitive strategy training, meaning that we teach a single strategy for how to think through solving problems as opposed to a strategy to solve a specific problem. So it's essentially the teach a man to fish proverb. If we teach patients and care partners to be active problem solvers, then they'll be able to manage whatever problems may arise in the future with more independence. So as far as the research evidence goes, there's emerging evidence that problem solving strategies like PST are effective for patients and caregivers alike. And it's been studied in numerous diagnoses. And this evidence suggests that individuals can incorporate the core principles of PST rapidly into their daily life and that those benefits do not diminish over time. So this is just a quick example of how the PST framework works. And keep in mind, there's an entire manual that guides this approach. So I'm not demonstrating the approach per se, but rather just giving an example of how to use these mnemonics. So the first is A, assess the problem. And for the sake of conversation here, I've selected an easy problem, I'm out of shape. 
it's not really an easy problem. It's an easy problem to solve with PSD or to talk through PSD. So the second is brainstorming. B, so you have the patient or caregiver brainstorm solutions as well as pros and cons to each of those solutions. So in this case, my solutions might be, I'm gonna do nothing about it. I'm gonna start exercising or I'm gonna change my diet. Then we go through and discuss pros and cons of each of those. So pro and con of doing nothing, the pro would be easy, the con, well, I stay unfit. Start exercising, a pro would be I'm gonna get stronger, but a con would be it's uncomfortable. And the solution changing my diet, the pro would be I lose weight, but it's very time consuming to do all that meal prep. So, <clears throat> the next step is C, choose a solution. So I'm gonna choose that I'm gonna start exercising. So then you're gonna D, develop a plan and do it. So the plan should be very specific. In this case, I'm gonna get my stationary bike out of the attic on Monday after work. I'm gonna cycle three times a week at 6.30 a.m. before work, and I'm gonna keep a log of my exercise sessions. Okay, fast forward a week, the person has put their plan um, into action and they come back and we're gonna evaluate how it went. So I partially accomplished my plan. I cycled two times a week and I kept a log, but I was too tired to cycle on Friday mornings. So now we're gonna F, we're gonna flex the plan. I'm gonna, I moved my Friday cycling day to Saturday and voila, I had success. So now I'll make a new plan to improve my nu nutrition. And with that one, you walk all the way back through all the steps. So PST is simple and from what we can determine from research, it's effective. The approach does require some training um, on the therapist side and obviously on the um, participant side. So most of the studies of PST in stroke and TBI, we've done it both at UT Southwestern, for both patients and caregivers, um, they've been in an outpatient setting. So usually in the chronic phases of stroke, some, some subacute studies as well. And the research suggests that it's effective in these settings. Um, keeping in mind that the majority of these studies have been small and underpowered. So just to give you an idea of the logistics of an intervention protocol, the patient works through the PST strategy on paper, and if needed, they can have a scribe. Um, and they're guided by these prompts and schematics um, in these worksheets that they use um, to work through the PST method. And the therapist who's guiding the patient or the caregiver through the strategy training sort of fades out over time as the patient begins to pick it up for themselves. And the training has also been successful in a group setting. So you can see here, this is how we implemented it, how we have implemented it in most of our studies. Um, and you can sort of read through all that. But I think often that as therapists, we feel rushed, like, okay, we have 45 minutes to fix this person's problem today, instead of guiding the person to solve their own problems. We often want to do it for them or just give them the answer. But is that really setting them up for success long term? And is that empowering the patient or the caregiver to solve problems once the therapist is out of the picture? And I think taking the time to teach a patient or a caregiver this strategy may better serve them long-term, especially early on when the patient's transitioning home from the hospital with these often dramatic changes to their roles or their routines and their habits and their identities really. So it can feel really overwhelming for the patient and their family. And if we send patients home armed with this strategy to solve problems that are inevitably going to arise, can we ease that transition? And can we increase self-efficacy and ultimately decrease hospital readmission um, if these patients or caregivers can implement self-management strategies off the bat? So the overarching question is, can we breed adaptive coping early after stroke? And I also mentioned before 
um, our studies have looked at PST implementation early after stroke and also after TBI um, while the patient is still an inpatient, um, either acute or in the inpatient rehab. And there's also another popular problem solving strategy uh, known as co-op or cognitive orientation to daily occupational performance. And the co-op approach is an occupational oriented problem solving approach based on learning theory, motor learning theory, and cognitive theory. And co-op uses this metacognitive strategy of goal plan do check. So kind of like PSTs, A, B, C, D, E, F. And this process allows the subject to set a goal and then the therapist guides the patient into developing a detailed plan to achieve that goal. And then the subject executes the plan, continuously checking whether the goal is accomplished. And finally, they verify whether a modification is needed to accomplish their goal. So we know that co-op is also feasible and patients are demonstrating significant performance improvements with its use. And they're also able to transfer that strat strategy to new and untrained goals. The majority of co-op studies are also in the outpatient study uh, setting, just like PST. And so the patient population tends to be subacute or chronic phase. So co-op is generally activity-based and it's a bit more cut and dry than PST, to be honest. But PST includes steps like brainstorming solutions and determining the pros and cons of each of those solutions and then choosing a solution. And it also includes this flex step that allows the patient or the client to flex or change the plan or even possibly pick a whole new solution. So one isn't necessarily better than the other. And to be honest, it likely depends on the situation and the person as to which method is best. But we've chosen to use uh, PST because we had a bit of a legacy to rely on to begin with. Um, a member of our department had used it successfully in a large study of caregivers of patients with TBI. But we're also interested in using a strategy that we felt best lent itself to the potential of didactic use. So like the patient and the caregiver working together um, using the strategy. Because we knew we ultimately wanted to go there uh, research-wise and we felt that PST, although perhaps a bit more complicated, allows for a bit more conversation and collaboration. <clears throat> but we have used um, co-op based studies as well as PST based studies to inform our study design and to justify some of the outcome measures that we use um, because they are similar approaches. Okay, so this is the largest study of PST in stroke. Um, there's this one is by Visor in 2016. Um, there's not a whole lot of literature on PST implementation after stroke. And so this is the largest study by far. This one had 166 patients. Um, the median time post-stroke was seven months. This, in this case, PST was provided in a group setting. And um, after six months, the PST group showed significant improvement compared to the control group and task-oriented coping, but not in stroke-specific psychosocial health-related quality of life. And avoidant coping and the utility value for general um, health-related quality of life improved more in the PTS group at six months. So there is a growing body of literature which our, to which our team has contributed that supports um, PST for the re reduction of distress among care partners of individuals with acquired disabilities. And there've been four randomized control trials where PST was delivered predominantly via telephone to caregivers of adults with TBI beginning as early as one week post-discharge from the hospital. And all four of those trials showed greater reduction in depressive symptoms, and emotional distress among caregivers in the PST group compared to control. Um, and three trials demonstrated greater reduction in maladaptive problem solving. <laughs> so there are promising results with these problem solving based interventions, but we really aren't sure who to give it to. So do we give it to the caregiver versus the patient versus a dyadic approach? When do we give it? At what dose do we give it? Who should be giving it? 
and what are the long-term effects? So does PST actually ease the transition from hospital to home? Does it decrease hospital readmission? And does it increase independence and quality of life in the long-term? <clears throat> so this is a small study that we did last year and we implemented PST in caregivers of patients with TBI, stroke, SCI, and burn injury who were either in acute care or in, so the patient was either in acute care or in inpatient rehab. So this was an early intervention of PST. We did six sessions of PST either in person or over the phone. And our sample size was small, we just had 11 people. But overall, they were very satisfied with the intervention based on the client's satisfaction questionnaire. And they rated their level of confidence in their ability to apply the PST strategy after the completion of the intervention at an average of nine on a 10 point scale. So on average, participants felt confident using the PST strategy and, um, and they also felt good about it after just three sessions. So something else to consider. We generally do have been doing six sessions, so potentially we could do even less. In this case, the median change for the PHQ-8 depression was negative three, which indicated a decrease in depressive symptoms from baseline to one month post-discharge. <clears throat> and the cumulative probability of lower scores was greater at one month post-discharge relative to baseline. So caregivers reported less frequent or severe depressive symptoms after PST intervention compared to the before. So this is really a feasibility study and we didn't have a comparison group. So consider that when you interpret the results here. What we learned was that people liked it and they learned it quickly and they felt confident in their ability to use the strategy. <clears throat> okay. So now I'll talk about um, our implementation of PST among stroke patients. Um, and this was the one that we just completed a couple months ago. So this was a feasibility and early efficacy of PST for adults with stroke during um, inpatient rehab. Okay, so our objective was to determine the feasibility of delivering PST early on. And we did a single group pre post test intervention. Um, the, it started in inpatient hospital stay and we followed up with them three months post discharge. So our intervention was we did up to six sessions if possible um, for each patient. Uh, we only did the final session by phone if needed. Um, the patients self-selected all their problems and I'll get into that in a minute. And the intervention was delivered by an occupational therapy student in her second year. And we had weekly mobile health boosters. So there was also a mobile health component to this one that I'll get into. So our inclusion criteria was less than four weeks since the stroke, had to speak English, older than 18, Western aphasia battery score greater than 50, MOCA greater than 20. They had to have the capacity to self-consent and they also had to have ownership of a smartphone and be able to use it independently or with assistance. <clears throat> so the study was just over a year long. We did get some extensions due to COVID. So we had some issues there. But, um, we screened 56 patients and about 30% were eligible, which was around what we predicted. Of the 30%, 88% consented to the study. <clears throat> so we ended up with 15 enrollees. We did have four withdrawals, um, two for unknown reasons, one refused three or more PST sessions, and one was withdrawn by the study team due to a worsening medical condition. So 11 finished the study. For those that were ineligible, it was mostly due to a language barrier. Usually those patients spoke Spanish. And we also had some staff shortage issues due to COVID. So 10 people who were likely eligible were not approached. <clears throat> this was a participant, oh, you can't see it. Participant characteristics. 
Um, so those who withdrew were slightly younger than those who completed the study and they were more often female. They reported less independence with ADLs prior to their stroke. All of those who withdrew had a right-sided hemorrhagic stroke. And this represented all of our participants with hemorrhagic stroke. So though the sample size was small, it may suggest that those with poor awareness, which is most common after the right-sided hemorrhagic stroke may not see the potential benefits of this type of intervention, or they may have just had less insight of their deficits. We also compared all the patients screened to those who consented. And the only significant finding there was um, that compared to all the screened patients, those who consented were more often African-American and less often Hispanic. <clears throat> okay, so we used the DPAT or the Discharge Planning Assessment Tool to help patients hone in on the problems that they wanted to work on. <clears throat> this tool was developed at TWU by Marsha Neville. Many of you may know her. It's a really good tool. So if you're interested, you can just go to the TWU website and look that up. Little plug for Marsha. Anyway, so <clears throat> patients with the assistance from the interventionist moved through each section of the DPAT and decided if a specific area or task may be a problem for them once they're home. And the tool sort of helps to prompt discussion and problem solving about barriers and supports that the patient may have at home. And so this helped the patient sort of hone in on what it was they wanted to work on um, before discharge. And this, they completed the DPAD during the first uh, session of the PSD intervention. Okay, so I put this slide up um, because I think it's interested, interesting, but keep in mind that the goal of the intervention is actually not to solve these problems necessarily, but rather to learn the problem solving strategy. So it's an added plus if they actually solve their problem, but um, the overarching idea behind all this is that they actually learn the strategy. So these were the, the problems that they listed um, in our inpatient rehab unit. So two people were concerned about returning to driving, uh, retrieving items from the refrigerator, using bathroom supplies. Transferring in and out of the shower was a big one five people concerned about that. With their doorway at home, carrying items while using a water walker and sit to stand transfers. So goal attainment scaling or GAS was our primary outcome. And we looked at goal achievement at discharge and weekly for three months using that um, mobile health piece of the intervention that I mentioned. So GAS is commonly used in rehab research. And it allows patients and care providers to collaboratively develop um, and measure goals. But it's scored in a standardized way that allows comparison of change within and between groups. Um, so patients received a text message weekly that included a link which interfaced with our REDCap system. And we asked them to report if they set a goal for that week and the level of attainment for their last goal that they set. And the GAS scale is of level of attainment is, you know, I, I attained it much more than I expected. Um, I did somewhat more than I expected. I, I attained it at the expected level or somewhat less than expected or much less than expected. <clears throat> Okay, so these were our GAS results and we had very few people, so it's just sort of descriptive percentages, but 81% of participants who set at least one goal during the hospital stay achieved at least one goal and 72% achieved at least 50% of the goals that they attempted in the hospital. Now, only six of the participants used the electronic booster at all. So all the participants who used the electronic booster reported that they achieved at least one goal and four achieved more than one goal. Overall, the participants um, who used the electronic booster were satisfied with it based on the TUQs. We use a telehealth usability questionnaire. Um, but they found that the booster was only moderately useful. So I'll come back around to that in a minute. 
All right, these were depressive symptoms change, changes. So participants reported moderate depression on average at baseline, and then decreasing to mild depression at the time of discharge and three months post-discharge. So can we attribute this to PST intervention? We cannot necessarily, but we can be glad that our patients are on average getting less depressed and not more depressed as time passes. And these were the self-efficacy outcomes um, per patient. So patients rated their self-efficacy at baseline as moderately high um, with an increase at the time of discharge and also three months uh, post-discharge. Again, we can't necessarily attribute that to PST. We also tried to look at some coping outcomes using the coping orientation to problems experienced brief or the brief cope. But to be honest, the measure didn't really seem sensitive enough and there was a lot of noise in the data. So we will likely choose another measure to look at coping in the future. Okay, so back to the boosters. <clears throat> of the 15 who consented, as I said before, only six set at least one goal using those electronic boosters after discharge from the hospital. And four of the participants set two or more goals. So the mHealth boosters were not all that well received. Um, <clears throat> and <laughs> we trained people to use the boosters on their last session which was probably a mistake. And looking back in the literature after that happened, most people who um, had a similar intervention trained participants like two or three weeks out before they were using the e-booster on their own. So I think in the future, we would do something along those lines. Um, and that way we could, we could um, take care of any issues that people were having and make sure that they were following through with the booster in the future. And we also didn't, if they weren't using the booster over time, we didn't implement any follow-ups or any text messaging to ask them why they're not using it or anything like that. So that's something else that I would probably do in the future. So overall, the booster compliance was limited in our study. So I think if we implemented those changes in the future that we might have um, better participation with the boosters. And another idea was to actually do the intervention over the transition. So start it in the hospital, maybe for the first three sessions and then do the second three potentially over the phone once they transitioned home. Um, so that may also have a positive impact on the outcomes. So overall participants were satisfied, um, very satisfied with the intervention and those who used the booster were satisfied with it. Um, so in conclusion, the PST inpatients with stroke during the inpatient rehab stay is feasible, um, but there were barriers to participation, specifically in health adherence that we could address in the future. Okay, so future studies underway um, that are kind of related to this. I have a small Neuronext grant um, and the idea is to combine PSD intervention with transcranial magnetic stimulation in patients with stroke who demonstrate executive function deficits. So the IRB is underway for that one. Um, we also have another project which is funded by the Communities Foundation of Texas. Um, and we are translating PST into Spanish <clears throat> and then culturally validating that translation. So that's actually in the works currently. Um, our next step is to look at the effectiveness overall of PST in patients versus care partners versus a dyadic approach. Um, we've got a couple QI projects going on where we're implementing PST or our therapists at UT Southwestern are implementing PST. So we're looking at some outcomes there. And next step is probably to expand PST delivery to the general inpatient uh, rehab population. And that's it. Thank you, Candice, for that um, 
uh, presentation. I'm so interested in this um, from a oh, perspective of self-management. And I was, example. thank you. Yes, I was wondering. I don't want to speak on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> oh, please mute yourself if uh, if uh, you don't have any questions currently. But I wanted to find out um, in your um, uh, literature review, were you able to find instances of use of the problem solving um, uh, approach uh, for self management and chronic conditions um, in the community? Let's say for um, you know stroke support groups and uh, similar sort of similar uh, population. You mean and being implemented in the community, so not like yes. a little base kind of, I have not actually seen that. Most of what I've seen um, is it's hospital based or ambulatory clinic based. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not come across that. It's interesting. Thank you. Good idea. Uh, Jean, you can um, unmute and. Ask your question, please. Oh, nice talk, Candace. Thank you so much for it. Yeah. So when you're applying PST and people have multiple problems, is there um, a strategy for which one you select to guide them through the process first? And when you kind of add in other problems or do you only stick with one problem at a time? So to start, so the idea is to teach them the strategy, right? So <clears throat> to start, we usually try to, if they can have a bunch of problems, right? And that's actually, I use the DPAT for this study, but there is actually sort of a worksheet that goes along specifically with PST. Um, and it asks about all these different areas in your life. So the idea is that people do come up with a bunch of problems. And then you sort of hone it down to the most important one that the person really wants to work on. And it's better if it's a simpler problem. So even if they have a complex problem, you try to direct them to a piece of that complex problem, if that makes sense. So you can start with just a piece of a problem and work from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Candace. This is really interesting. I'm, I'm also extremely interested. I wanted to ask about the dosing, which is always a question, I think, with multiple interventions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how much you give. Have you ever thought of or what are your thoughts on uh, instead of having a standard amount of, of treatment sessions or dosages, but sort of a, a sliding scale or um, administering enough interventions till the client reaches a certain level uh, in a way, like a target um, outcome is, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Um, we've traditionally used six, but um, even, you know, with the, what I was doing in inpatient, it was hard to get six in sometimes because they would discharge and then they end up with just three or four. But you know, most people have been satisfied with as little as three and they've been successful with that. Um, but there are people who require more. So that's interesting. I wonder if you could come up with some sort of measure, or, you know, to decide when they get here, are they ready to, you know, wean off or whatever? Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually thinking, you know, if you could implement this even in the home setting after they've been discharged, mm -hmm. maybe you'd have more time. And, and you're right, I could see some people not needing as many, some people maybe needing more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we have been, it is validated over the phone. So it's, it has been extremely successful over the phone. And my colleague does most of her interventions in TBI and she conducts most of it over the phone, she does more in care partners, not in the patient. Um, and it has been very successful with that. So I think I think the idea of doing, even starting it in the hospital and doing some of it at home, even by phone um, is a possibility. Great, yeah. very interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And so I have another question for you. So I've been using a similar model um, in some of the research that we've been doing and trying to um, use it to help individuals to figure out how to use their weaker arm and hand better after stroke. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the, the actual goals or the, the problems that you're identifying. Is it more that they are occupation-based? Are they more integrating in, well, how might I use that arm and hand better during these desired tasks, et cetera? Mm -hmm. You know, I've found, and once again, you know, they get to choose their own problems and it really has been more functional task and, uh, well, I guess activity and participation and less, um, physical function. Mm -hmm. Um, and that may be because we're using the D pad or something similar. And so they're thinking in that way, rather than asking them, you know, do you want your upper extremity to be able to do this or that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it may be more the measure um, or the media that we're using to um, help them decide on their problems. But it's generally been, yeah, participation and activity type things and less um, range of motion, strength, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But you could use it in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I've also found that then the cueing or those strategies that you're you're using are very different in terms of how they're focused. You know, it's more like, you know, what do I need to do to get my hand ready to open that doorknob or mm -hmm. turn the doorknob versus I'm just gonna open the door. So it, yeah, it, and, and we've had a lot of interest in I presented this um to some of the ther like uh stroke-based therapists maybe a few weeks ago, and they were all really interested in it, specifically the physical therapist. And so I think using it in that way, um, we haven't trained them yet, but um, I think that's an interesting way to think. And I think they'll be, they would be more interested in something like that. So, so I think that's probably on the horizon for us to sort of work through some of that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, Candice, there is a question in the chat box about trying some of these strategies with um, the PTs and the stroke population to approach gait training. So yeah. it's sort of similar to your discussion. Yeah, and I'm excited to do it. We haven't quite started, but I think um, their input on how to use it uh, will be really interesting. So more to come there. Yeah, I think the combination of cognitive behavioral um, strategies with our, our techniques are going to be a win, right? For some of the, definitely a lot of the people, it, it, it might work. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, I just want to say thank you to um, Candice for uh, doing this talk um, today. And I do want to remind everyone, we're taking a break in May. Um, so our next uh, virtual happy hour, um, drinks not included, uh, will be June 17th, and it'll be hosted um, by the our Transitions and Continuity of Care uh, Task Force, so more um, details on that, but it's totally related to what we've been talking about in terms of self-management and all that, so thank you very much, Candice, for um, doing this for us, and this uh, has been recorded and will probably be available soon um, on the ACRM website. So, uh, Veronica, do you have anything else to add before we say goodbye? No, just thank you to all, and uh, excellent work, Candace. Thanks for sharing. We look yeah. forward to hearing you more at the conference, annual conference. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Candace. Yeah, bye. Great job.